All right, everybody, welcome back. So uh, this is the second set of notes that we're going to take on centripetal forces. Um, uh, last time we looked at centri centripetal forces and basically things moving in circles. And we're just going to look at a couple of um, variations on that where things might get a little bit more complicated. So um, the first example here, we're going to imagine a, um, a mass attached to a string and it's whir being whirled around in a vertical circle. So it's going up in the air and then coming back down and around. So it's going in that vertical circle. Um, if we were to draw the forces that are acting on this. Um, at the bottom of the circle I would have a uh, force of gravity pulling downwards, so FG downwards, and I guess at the top of the circle I would also have uh, FG downwards. Now um, I guess I would also have a tension in the string, so as this whirls around the circle I would have a tension in the string. At the top the tension in the string would be pulling downwards, and so it might be something like that, maybe call it FT. At the bottom, the tension in the string would be pulling upwards. And you've seen the way I've drawn these here. The tension when it's at the bottom of the circle is not going to be the same as it is at the top. Okay? So remember, anytime something moves in a circle, there's a centripetal force. And that's the force, that, the net force that's causing it to move in a circle. So anything moving in a circle has a net force acting on it. But in this case, the net force is going to be different depending on where you are in the circle. Now, at the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle, the force of gravity is going to be the same. So the force of gravity up here at the top has got to be the same as the force of gravity at the bottom. This isn't changing. What's changing as you go around and around the circle is the tension force. At the top of the circle, so at the top of the circle, if I was to do my FC equation, remember that's just a, a net force equation. I could do winners minus losers. Um, in this case, I'll take the down direction as being the winning direction. And so FG and tension are both working in the same direction. So that would be FG plus tension. They're both working downwards. But at the bottom of the arc, at the bottom of the arc, all of a sudden now, I would have my centripetal force, winners minus losers. I'm going to take this tension force as being the winner. And then I'm going to have gravity as a loser. So it's going to be FG, uh, sorry, FT minus FG. And I guess what I'm saying is I'm just defining the winning direction as being towards the center of the circle. Because I know that whenever I move in a circle, the net force, the centripetal force, pulls towards the center of that circle. So let's do an example here. Um, a 1.7 kilogram object is swung from the end of a string in a vertical circle. The time of one revolution is 1.1 seconds. What is the tension in the string? So I've got this object here, and then at some other point in time, it's up there. And I'm gonna just redraw my free body diagram, just force of habit. So FG is going to be the same in both locations, but what's gonna change here is my tension force. So at the top, I'm gonna have a little bit of a tension force downwards. And then at the bottom, I'm gonna have a large tension force upwards. I hope this sort of makes sense because at the top of the circle, gravity and tension are working together to accelerate this object down towards the center. At the bottom, um, tension has to work against gravity. So tension is gonna be much larger at the bottom because it not only has to uh, beat gravity, but on top of that, it's the only thing that's accelerating this towards the center of the circle. So it has to be much, much larger. So uh, find the tension in the string. So at the top, FC is going to equal uh, FT plus FG. And FC, uh, recall our formulas for FC, that's either MV squared over R or M4 pi squared R over T squared. And we learned that in the last video. So if in this case I know the radius is 0.6 and I know that the, t uh, the time period is 1.1, I'm gonna use this second version of this equation. And so this whole thing is going to equal M4 pi squared R over T squared. And solving for tension, it'll be the difference between these two. So the force of tension is gonna equal m4 pi squared r over t squared minus force of gravity, which the force of gravity is just mg. So I'll sub in my values, 1.7 times four <laughs> times pi squared times r. Don't know why I used brackets there for pi squared, but I'm just gonna go with it. Uh, divided by 1.1 squared minus mass, 1.7 times 9.8. And I'll put this joyous calculation into my calculator here and see what I get. So um, don't forget to square pi. 
That's kind of a funny thing to do, so don't forget to do that. Times 0.6 divided by 1.1 squared. So there is my, uh, my centripetal force, and I'm going to subtract from that my force of gravity, which is 1.7 times 9.8. And so my overall force is right around 16.6. 16.6 newtons is my uh, tension force. You can see, not very big. When we compare that to the bottom though, uh, a little bit of a different story. So at the bottom, uh, Fc is going to equal Ft minus Fg. And so when I rearrange this, Ft uh, is going to equal Fc plus Fg. They're gonna work together. So m4 pi squared r over t squared plus mg. And I guess if I had planned this better, I could have saved myself the hassle of calculating, but I just love punching these numbers into the calculator. So away we go. Oh, just kidding, I had it there. So 33, 33.279 was my uh, centripetal uh, force. And I'm gonna add to that 1.7 times 9.8. And so I get an answer of 49.9. And there is my tension force. So clearly much bigger at the bottom. If you're spinning an object, uh, a mass on a string, and you're spinning it around and around faster and faster, um, there's probably a maximum speed you could spin at. Eventually you would get to the point where the tension would be too much for the string and the string might break. And so you could think about where would that be most likely to break as you're spinning it in a circle? Would it be most likely to, to break at the top or would it most likely to break at the bottom? And then follow that forward another step. There's a maximum speed you could spin at when the string breaks, but is there a minimum speed? Is there like a minimum speed you could go at? So you go slower and slower and slower and eventually this no longer moves in a circle as you go around and around. Um, and so as you spin slower and slower, or I should say, as you spin faster and faster, the tension would increase. But as you spin slower and slower, the tension would decrease. And so eventually, you would get to a point where if you go slow enough, the tension at the top would essentially be zero. And so if you have no tension and you only have gravity, then in actual fact, what you have is something called weightlessness. And when something is weightless, that's because the only force acting on it is gravity. So weightlessness is actually just about the worst name for something. It's not that there's no gravity working on it, it's that there is only gravity on it. And you could imagine that object on a string going around a circle and just barely making it through that circle. That would be a situation where gravity is pulling down, but no tension force required to keep it moving in a circle. So at that minimum speed, as you're going around in a circle up here, you could have this situation where it just barely makes it through and you've only got Fg pulling it around. So if we swing an object in a vertical circle with a radius of 0.75 meters, what's the minimum speed for the object at the top of the motion to remain in circular motion? Well, in this case, Fc is going to equal Fg, and that's it. All I need is gravity to keep it moving in that circle. And so I know that Fc is gonna be Mac, and I know that Fg is Mg, and kind of a funny thing, what we notice is, wait a second, the masses of the object, or the mass of the object, I should say, is gonna cancel out. It doesn't actually matter. Since we're looking for the uh, speed, I'll use this version of centripetal acceleration, which is V squared over R, and that would just be equal to G. And so solving for V, I get this situation where V is equal to root GR. And so this is actually true when things are weightless. And so this applies to, for example, spinning an object on a string. But what we'll talk about in a little bit is what happens when things are orbiting? What happens when a satellite goes around the planet and, and, or an astronaut, an astronaut is, is weightless out in space? And so we'll see this, this formula kind of come up again. So um, in this case, it's going to be root 9.8 times 0.75. Five. And so I can calculate that. So the square root of 9.8 times 0.75, and that's going to be 2.7 meters per second. Okay. So notice that um, if the velocity is constant, then as it goes around in that circle, um, uh, or if, if we spin it around at a constant rate, maybe I should say, it's the velocity is only going to depend on G and R. 
And so for the special case where you're finding that minimum speed, the velocity is equal to the root of g and r. And that's because at the minimum speed, the centripetal force is just equal to gravity. So that formula comes from this uh, initial um, uh, uh, situation where we say our centripetal force is just equal to gravity. We solve from there. So another example of a different kind of problem that we're going to look at is um, uh, a banked curve. So you may have noticed uh, if you're driving on the highway potentially or if you come off an off-ramp or on an on-ramp to the highway, sometimes when you're going around in a circle, they'll actually bank the roads. Um, and by that I mean they'll actually be at a bit of an incline. So um, the reason we do that is because, well, it's safer. Essentially, you can drive at a faster speed around in a circle if the road itself is actually tilted. And we'll see why that is in a second. So this picture right here, I want to try and make sure it's clear what's going on here. So I'm going to draw on some brake lights. This is a car, a very boxy car. This car is driving away from us. So it's on an incline. It's on a bank corner, but it's not sliding down the incline. It's driving away from us on the incline. And so, for example, there's a force of gravity here, but its velocity is heading away from us. So there's my force of gravity. And so um, what other force would be working at work here? Now it actually says, imagine a frictionless banked corner. And uh, no roads aren't frictionless, and that's a good thing. But um, we actually, it turns out, we don't even need friction to make it around a corner if it's banked steeply enough. So um, a quick example of that would look something like this here. So imagine a car going around a corner. Um, because it's banked, the weight pulls down, the net force is in towards the center of the circle, but that large green arrow, that N, that's our normal force. And so as it goes around and around a circle, this is the picture I want you to, to have in your mind. Um, in this case, gravity pulls down, the normal force is perpendicular to the surface, and the net centripetal force is directed inwards. And so um, if I go back to my picture here, so I had a net force, my net force, sorry, my normal force, I should say, my normal force, my normal force, was directed this way. Now, I'm not sure if you can tell from the video, but in this case, the normal force is actually larger than the force of gravity. And so, um, so this angle right here, I understand that the normal force is gonna be perpendicular to the surface, but this is a case where the normal force is actually gonna be larger than our force of gravity. So um, on a frictionless corner, only gravity and normal force are going to act on the car. And note that the Fn is larger. And this is because Fn both uh, has to beat gravity and accelerate the car inward. So the sum of Fn and Fg must equal Fc. So a few ways we could picture this. Let's imagine that I was to add these two vectors together. So if I was to add my force of gravity, and then I was to add my normal force, there would be something left over. So you can see this force here that's left over, which is directed kind of inwards. That's my centripetal force. Another way to think about this is if I break my normal force down into components, so if I think of this as being like FNY and FNX, you could see that FNY and gravity could be equal and opposite, but then there would be this leftover X component, which would be pulling the car uh, inwards. This is my centripetal force. So two different ways to approach the same problem. Um, and so imagine we've got uh, uh, finding the angle, a problem here, we're trying to find the angle at which a frictionless curve must be banked if a car is to round it safely at a speed of 22 meters per second, if the radius is 475 meters. So there's my banked corner, here's my car. And so we're trying to figure out what that angle is there. Now if I go back to this picture, this might be easier to see on this, this larger picture here, this angle is going to be related to this, uh, this triangle right here. So if we were to draw a line that was parallel to the slope here, we can see that this angle here, theta, that angle theta would be the same as this angle here, theta 
which means this angle would be complementary to theta, which means theta would be this angle at the top. As a comparison, when I added the two vectors here, what you'd find is this angle here should be equal to theta. So when we uh, have this question here, where we've got a car driving around a bank curve, and I've got my force of gravity pulling down, and then I've got my um, normal force at an angle here, uh, the force of gravity plus the normal force would equal this centripetal force, Fc. So this angle here is theta. Um, I know that my force of gravity is mg. I know that my centripetal force is mv squared over r. And then I don't actually know what my normal force is, but it turns out I don't think I really need it. Because if I was to say that tan of theta would have to equal fc over fg, that would equal mv squared over r all divided by mg, we can see that the m's are going to cancel out. And so I end up with v squared over rg, which uh, I know. I know my velocity, I know r, and of course I know g. So um, let's just solve this. So tan theta is going to equal uh, 22 divided by 475 times 9.8 squared. Uh, so zero point. So theta would just be the inverse tan of that number. Which is about 5.9 degrees. <clears throat> okay, so as a last example here, we've got a toy plane attached to a string, so it flies in a circle. Um, again, I've got a similar situation here where because it's making an angle, uh, the gravity might pull straight down. But the string that's making an angle here is pulling up with a tension kind of like this. And when I add these two forces up, the tension force, maybe I'll call it F of T, plus the force of gravity are going to add up in such a way that they're left over with this centripetal force. So I know the mass of the toy plane, and I know this angle right here is 28 degrees. Uh, and I know the radius of the circle. And so we're looking for what is the period of rotation. So I'm going to need to solve for my centripetal force. So in this case, I could say that the tan of 28 degrees is equal to Fc over Fg. Or Fc is just equal to Fg tan 28, which is equal to Mg tan 28. And so the mass of the uh, toy plane is 0.25. So... 0.25 times 9.8 times the tan of 28 gives me this. And so I've got a centripetal force of 1.30, 1.30 newtons. Now to find the period of rotation, I'm going to use my centripetal force equation, which is m4 uh, pi squared r over t squared. And solving that for t, I would get uh, the square root of m4 pi squared r over fc. So I'm just running out of space a little bit there, but I'll punch the numbers in my calculator and we'll see what we get. So um, I've got the mass of 0.25 uh, times 4 times pi squared times 0.8 divided by my central force 1.3, and don't forget I need to take the square root of this whole thing, of the answer, and so we're right around 2.5 seconds. Okay, that is it for centripetal forces.